Hey guys, you're listening to Metal Matters, a weekly Gimme Radio podcast. I'm your host, Mike Hill. If you like metal, punk, hardcore, or anything extreme, you've come to the right place. So subscribe and never miss out. This week, we have Champ Morgan of Black Ops. He's someone I've known for nearly two decades. I've stayed in his house. Our bands have played shows together. He's an all-around great guy. And uh, we're going to talk about Black Ops, which is his post-Kill the Client band, and also what we've been doing to get through this difficult period of isolation, how we've been dealing with the monotony, if there's any anxiety, and all that sort of stuff. Metal Matters will be coming at you guys every week, and I hope it helps everyone get through this. I hope everyone's staying safe and staying healthy. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review us, and also share with your friends. It's good to hear from you. You know, I'm glad that uh, we're able to do this. It's just kind of crazy down here, man. I mean, I'm still working a full schedule for now. I mean, it seems like jobs may be starting to drop off, but since I'm in security, you know, it's like, it's essential, but we close Natalie's salon, of course. Yeah, that's, that sucks, man. It's, um, you know, I, I have a pretty full schedule at my job as well. Uh, still full time with everything, but I feel fortunate for that. And I, I hear about so many people that are out of work right now and, um, it's a pretty fucked up situation, man, but you know, hopefully we get through this thing. Hopefully we pull out on the other side. And uh, one of the things I was thinking is that maybe some positive change might come out of all this stuff too, you know? I mean, people are realizing how fucked up the government is right now on so many levels. I mean, they're going to, people are going to be looking pretty hard for change because there's a lot of, a lot of bullshit going on right now. And it's really bubbled up to the surface in a major way. Exactly. And uh, so what have you been doing? Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, you've been working, you got a full schedule and that definitely helps with the mentality, keeping things together. Uh, But in addition to that, what have you been doing to kind of keep yourself uh, in a, in a good mental state? Cause uh, the monotony is like the fucking killer, man. Well, of course the, you know, the gym's closed, so I can't do jujitsu and Thai boxing. So I mean, you've been to my house, you know, yeah. I got stuff in my garage. I, I've been training like six days a week right now. I just, I work all day and then I come home and then I'll train lift and, you know, do heavy, I got a, I got a heavy bag in the garage now, which really helps get some of the helps, you know, release some stress by beating the hell out of that thing. Yeah. That's awesome. But I'll, I'll, you know, I'll train anywhere from like an hour and a half to two hours every day. I already trained today and. If I didn't have that, I'd be in a lot worse place. But, you know, it's a, I've been, I worked in the fitness industry before. So having that amount of gear, collecting that amount of gear over time is really kind of paying off right now. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And, uh, you know, here in New York, uh, living in an apartment, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I mean, especially like I, w- I was going outside, there's a playground nearby, but little by little, they're shutting everything down as far as that goes too. Uh, there's no, you know, all the playgrounds are closed, so I can't go there and, you know, do uh, burpees or jump rope or anything like that. So that's, uh, that's off the table right now. And uh, what I did t- today, I just started this pretty awesome rooftop workout, which, uh, you know, I got a kettlebell. I'm able to do stuff with a kettlebell, uh, push-ups, uh, rounds. I stole this uh, thing I saw off GSP's Instagram with some squats and kicks and all that kind of stuff, and then some shadow boxing, and that's pretty much all I can do here. I got tie nice. pads, but I got no one to hold them. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, people are like, "Oh, well, you can you know work jujitsu with your wife." I'm like, <laughs> "Yo, you motherfucker." <laughs> You motherfuckers don't know my wife. She hates that shit. Yeah, she man. used she used to box. Like her stand up is actually pretty good, but well, at least it used to be. I mean, we first met, she was boxing like three or four days a week in Oklahoma. That's awesome. And then I was, you know, I lived in Dallas, and I was, you know, doing jujitsu and Thai boxing and stuff. And she used to she used to have pretty fast hands. Yeah, man, it's important, you know what I mean? It's uh, especially uh, for women, I think, it's really important to at least be familiar with self-defense. And, uh, 
you know, people under always underestimate how well they would do in a physical altercation unless they have trained. You know, everyone thinks yeah. it's the movies where you, you know you're, you're you're like fighting someone for like you know this like scene where it's smashing bottles over each other's heads and jumping over tables and things like that. But like you know, out on out in the real world, a lot of these things take place in a matter of seconds. And unless like you know how to you know you are in that muscle memory of move, moving your head or putting your hands up or you know not leading with your chin, uh, it could go really bad for people. You know. Yeah, I mean, that people have that huge misconception that, you know, one, that street fights last a long time, two, that big flowery moves work, and three, they have no idea what it's like to get, I mean, physically hit hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's people that have been out there that, you know, you just get in like a, a, a verbal altercation, and you just slap them open hand to slap them and they're just in shock they just shut down like uh uh what but they start stuttering and shit like that and you're just like man you probably need to get the fuck away from me before i hurt you real bad because you're not <laughs> you're not ready for this yeah you know? exactly you know definitely yeah so that's kind of how you have to deal with drunk people sometimes you know i i haven't hit anybody in force in a long time but and, yeah, I mean, but, outside of training, I haven't really punched anyone or kicked anybody like with any real intention to hurt someone in quite a while, too. So I'm the same boat. Well, when I lived in Dallas, I I fought in the street all the time. I mean, that was just the way it was there. And then I, I moved here, and I haven't <laughs> I haven't been in a in a real fight except you know training at the gym in probably ten or eleven years by this time. That's a good thing, I think. You know, my thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially. Because one, times have changed. The legality of all that shit, you know, used to the. At least in Dallas, the cops would show up and just, you know, like, all right, dumbasses, you go that way, you go that way. You know, now it's like, you fight somebody, and just random people that are walking down the street will, you know, run up and start punching and kicking people they don't even know. They they have no place being in the altercation at all. But somebody's got a cell phone out, so you know, world star and all that moronic dumb shit, you know. So aside from uh, training and working out on your own, uh, you know, watching any movies or, you know, books or anything like that, uh, you know, there's like this, this whole uh, Tiger King thing that people are are enthralled (laughs) with, you know? Oh my God, dude, that, that show was incredible. It's, it it was, it was extremely funny and it was extremely sad at the same time because I mean, I'm, I'm from, my wife and I both are from Oklahoma. I'm not from in that kind of Oklahoma that that's Oklahoma, but Oklahoma's a crazy fucking place. But, you know, you got these people that are trying to own big cats, which you shouldn't own a fucking tiger on a personal level. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really give a shit who you are, you know, but it's just like you got one guy that's got tigers in a cage and you can pet the little babies. And then you have another lady that's, saying that these people are wrong for having tigers in cages while having tigers in cages. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's like a little, little ironic, definitely. <laughs> the tigers are still in a cage, no matter how you try to paint it. I, the sense I got from that whole thing, I mean, I, I reluctantly watched it. Uh, it wasn't something that I chose to watch. It was sort of uh, forced on me by uh, my significant other here. and uh, <laughs> But the... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I ended up making it through it and, you know, I love animals and I hate to see animals being abused. And uh, at the end, I just felt depressed after watching a couple episodes of that, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, it's it's just made me feel kind of like I needed to take a shower at the end of the whole thing. Oh, it, it definitely makes you feel dirty watching it. I mean, even if you're, you know, there's a whole bunch of crazy twists and turns in it and it's interesting just in the fact that there's just so many twists and and it's not fake you know it's all real which is kind of you know shocking to me that it's you know none of that shit is written it's, it just happened but yeah you definitely you know makes you feel dirty inside and out after watching it you're just like there's a whole bunch of what the fuck moments through that whole thing yeah totally man so you and i have known each other for quite a while at this point uh i remember we met in dallas when you were still living there i think yeah, I met you in 2000 and 
two, I want to say. I know the first time that I met you uh, was when the Mighty Anodyne was still together. Yeah. And then you guys had played in town a few times, and then, and I had seen you and met you then. Uh, but then when Kill the Client first played with you guys, and I think 2003, it was Anodyne, Kiss the Cynic, Ken Mode, and us. And you guys came to Dallas. I think that was the last Anodyne tour. I think you guys broke up after that. Possibly, yeah. yeah. I do remember meeting you at uh, in Dallas prior to that as well. I think we stayed at your house maybe. Probably. I had a I had a pretty open door policy for about ten years. Yeah, yeah. It was one of in those Dallas. Days. I remember the, the the first time we played with you is when I finished our set by jumping off the stage headfirst into a trash can full of broken glass and did the last two kill the client songs inside of <laughs> inside of a trash can. Yeah, no, I totally remember that, man. How how could you not remember <laughs> something like that? You know, some some guy jumping into a you know a trash can filled with broken glass and singing. It's like, how do you not forget? How do you forget something like that? You know? Yeah, that was a crazy, crazy time. <laughs> it was a good show, though. I mean, that was my first time. Like that's the first time the Kin Mode guys had come to the states and that far south, and you know those guys were shitting. They were they were still literally kids at that time. I think they were maybe twenty or twenty two tops, and they were out on the road. And like that was, <laughs> we played with them in Dallas, and then went to Houston and played together. And they were just like, "You guys are fucking insane!" Like we don't we don't even understand what Texas is about now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Your your tenure in Kill the Client like lasted that that was a, a long stretch of time that you were the singer of that band. And uh, you know, you guys have been through a couple so a couple lineup changes here and there, but uh so now your post Kill the Client career is in decidedly different music. I know that you played a protest for a while. I don't know if you're still doing that or not. Nope. I am no longer involved in that. And that band is kinda falling apart too i mean there's a lot of like internal issues with that band and i wish them the best but i just i one i don't have the time to do that um but also too there's a lot of internal workings in that thing that kind of got in a place that i don't want to be um close to kill the client wise brian Ferhardo and chris richardson the guitar player and drummer from kill the client we made a record, made a band called Triage, which is kind of, kind of picks up where Kill the Client left off, and that record came out really, really well. And we were planning on getting ready to start doing some stuff, and then this fucking coronavirus hit. But then I, I kind of put a lid on a lot of stuff, actually. <laughs> yeah, we can't. I mean, my other band, my other full time band, Black Ops, which is like a noise rock, weird, you know weird band we had shows playing we were playing with today is a day and actually it's supposed to be recording next week and you know obviously that's not going to happen it's the black ops stuff that really uh sort of like really piqued my interest too because i i gotta be honest i didn't really expect you to do something like that just knowing what you're uh, or expect you know my expectations are a little bit different as to what you might do as like a another band you know, and that that right now, that's your full time. Your all your intention is pretty much put into that, right? That's yeah. That's that's my main thing. I love it. You know, with some really talented guys. I mean, Mark Key, the guitar player. I've known him. You know, I think I met him in two thousand or two thousand and one. We've been friends a long time, and he's always been in really good bands. And you know, being we've always talked about doing something. And then we've just, you know, it finally happened. And now we got a, a new drummer, a way better drummer. His name's Pete. He's a young dude. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we've really kind of kicked everything up to the next level since Pete's come along. Yeah, I caught you guys live. Uh, there was that, uh, I think it might have been during South by Southwest or something. There was like uh, that year that I seemed to be uh, in Texas like every other month I felt like. Uh, I went to see you guys play. It was that that's the well, right? That's the name of the place. The Lost Well. The, the Lost Well. Lost. That's it. Lost Well. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, like a, almost like a multimedia kind of experience because you had a live band, you know, you had visuals, right? And then you had you handling electronics, 
And when did you get involved in doing electronics? Like, how did you pick that up? Like, what, at what point did you decide you wanted to pursue that? Um, that I started kind of getting an interest in that probably, I don't know, four or five years ago. Yeah. Um, cause I had, we had played with, um, full of hell when they were like little kids, exactly, <laughs> literally yeah. they were, yeah. they were, they were little kids. It was like, I, I saw, I saw full of hell, um, an endless blockade. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, and sick, I was man. Like, yeah. Yeah, you know, and at that point in my life, I had never really paid very much attention to like electronics or noise or any of that stuff. And I was just like, holy shit, like this stuff is fucking crazy. And these bands are ferocious, you know. And I was just like, man, I really, I need to start looking into this. Maybe this is something that I can, I can figure out because I've, I've never played any instrument. Like, I don't know how to fucking play anything. Um, but of course, I you know I get I get crazy ideas going through my head all the time, and so <clears throat> my thought to be different was I've always thought theremins were one of the most interesting things ever invented. So I was like, I'm going to make a noise rig that has a theremin in it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Man. <laughs> and, and I'm going to start like just buying pedals and plugging them in together until it sounds right, and you know, and it's taken a you know when I first got started trying to make it happen, it it really wasn't anywhere near what I wanted it to be. And then over a four year period of just, you know, experimentation, really, you know, <clears throat> I do the theorem. I play the theremin through about seven pedals into a full stack. And then I have, um, a chaos pad, a couple of oscillators, um, and a whole bunch of other pedals, including that sun life pedal, which I make all the, the, the crazy deep and you know, all those big drony, the earth falling apart sounds with, and I just run it all together through two full stacks. Damn. And it, yeah, it's, it's loud. It's crazy. All right. Now a lot over the years, over the whole course of my life, people have been talking about chaos pads and, uh, I, I, I just nod my head and I pretend I know what the fuck that is. Uh, and I, much to my chagrin, I don't know what the fuck a chaos pad is. So what, is, what, what exactly is a chaos pad? A chaos pad, the first ones were kind of big. They were probably like a 12 by 12 like box. And that has a bunch of different presets that you can load in it or use in it. And then as you touch and move your finger on the screen, it changes the pitch and the tone. And like you can you know do all these weird sound manipulations with it. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to run it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fucking hairless ape. I can't, you know, I don't have the, the brain power to do something super complicated, especially if I'm doing vocals at the same time. And, you know, it gets like to be an overload. And chaos pads are really super simple things to use. I have the chaos two, which is, I don't know, maybe a four by four, four by six little square box with a four by four pad in it. And there's a ton of different presets. And then I ha also have the third series of it, which um, you can basically build loops with. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. And um, you can you can build an infinite amount of loops in it. So I've been messing with that thing. Towards the end of the, before the rehearsal room got shut down, we were starting to use that when Black Ops and I was building like huge, crazy fucking sound, sound walls with it. Because, you know, you can start with just a few simple sounds and just loop them. And it, it makes eight second loops and you can start them and stop them just by pushing a button. And you can, you know, I got that thing up to like 20 or 25 different little loop samples and it sounded fucking insane. Damn. So it's... uh you can layer all that stuff together inside the box and just kind of play that out at, at like live basically. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Every bit of it. And it's, it's, it's literally uh, putting your finger on the pad and moving it around and pushing a button to start and stop your loop. It's nothing more than that. So you're armed with that and the theremin, which is also kind of like a pretty much just a tactile expression sort of device basically. Right. Like you're just using yeah. your hands for that too. Right. 
Yeah, the theremin was actually invented, I think, in 1914 in Russia by a Russian woman. Um, and all it really is is a, is a FM antenna, and the the upright antenna is pitch. The closer you get to it, the higher the the higher the pitch is and then the loop antenna on the left is the volume so it's really just playing with pitch sounds it's in, it's really hard to play because it's every literally every little small movement of your hand makes a difference hmm. okay yeah. but once you get the hang of it you can make it like a vibra- like a vibrato and you know you can you know, like ramp it up. And I play it through a, like a wah pedal, an overdrive, t- two choruses, um, a de- and a delay pedal. Yeah, it's so pretty it, cool, man. I, I, I was just trying to figure out what you were doing exactly, like when I saw you guys play that one time. And it's the recordings, it's like impossible to figure out what's making those sounds. So that's <laughs> why I figured I'd ask you right now, like what the hell is going on, you know? Yeah, it's, it's funny, like when people see us play the amount of people that like whip out their phones to start filming what I'm doing because nobody knows what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, man. And most people don't even know what a theremin is. You know, there's usually maybe one or two people at the shows that'll be like, is that, a, is, are you seriously playing a theremin in a heavy metal band? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am actually. The other thing I think that's cool is like, you know, a lot of bands that incorporate noise or noise bands or whatever, they're they're um they have like a fam- familiarity with like old noise stuff. You know what I mean? There's people out there like oh, yeah, I like Throbbing Gristle, I like White House, I like Mersbau. Mersbau is like that's the band that everyone references. Like oh yeah, I like noise music, I like Mers- Mersbau. It's like one. But my impression, at least, is that you're kind of coming at this from like a completely different angle. You know what I mean? Like you're not someone who's trying to emulate something you've heard before. You're actually just coming at this from like a band setting, like a hardcore punk, like metal grind kind of vibe. Like that's their background, at least to my knowledge of the bands you played in. And it's, it sort of adds this different angle to it. You know what I mean? Like there's thousands of fucking bands out there. that are doing quote unquote noise music, but they're all, they all have like a blueprint for what they're doing of previous things, you know? Yeah, uh, most of those people are, are are into harsh noise where, you know, it's like static blasts and all that like stuff that just sounds like cars crashing and all that. Yeah, I I personally don't like that stuff. It, you know, it, it's just like an anxiety builder. And what I do, I, I come from the direction I kind of think of what I do is more like uh the dude in neurosis you know he's just he's just adding a layer you know he's not trying to dominate the song he's just trying to add you know texturally colors to what's going on and that's what i what kind of what i'm trying to do too i I don't want to dominate the song with what i do you know i mean my guitar player writes some of the fucking sickest heaviest riffs i've ever heard in my life and I have a super talented drummer. I don't. Why would I want to make it sound like somebody threw a television down the stairs, you know, yeah. and just r- ruin that? I don't want to do that. I just want to add color. I want to add highlights in certain spots. I want to make you know ugly parts uglier, and you know sometimes just completely get away from from it at all, and just let the actual musicians, you know, throw the hammer down. I don't. You know, that's where I come from. It. I just. Harsh noise, I don't like that stuff. I mean, when people have like seven or, you know, 15 pedals and it just sounds like a, a 50 cent microphone listening to static off a TV from the 70s, like that's not entertainment to me. I mean, that's, that doesn't add anything. It doesn't add anything to, in, to anything. You know what I mean? Like it's, I just, uh, yeah, I tend to I agree with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that because um, I, I went through a phase like back in the '90s where um, I saw I saw Mersbau play and I saw this band Masana or a guy Masana, and the lot like it was just it was actually pretty cool to see it live because there was um, like a physical kind of component. Like there was when when Masana played, you know, there was a guy, he was like doing vocals too, and then. When Mersbau played, there was some dude screaming to a mic, like, 
throwing tables around and it was like a, a spectacle, you know what I mean? But I was like, oh, cool. I like noise. And then I ended up buying a bunch of records and I never listened to any of them really. It's like, I have like all these records. It's, I listen to a couple of them and I'm like, all right, you know, I have it. This is cool. You know, but it was more of like a conversational piece in some ways where it's like, oh yeah, you want to see my noise record collection? And there's like, some of them aren't even fucking open or I listen to once or whatever. And it's just, it's never been something that has really grabbed my attention unless it's being incorporated into like a musical, more musical setting, like what you guys are doing and, and like what full of hell does and neurosis, of course, you know, and today is the day, like all these bands that, that have like an actual rock band vibe, but there's these other electronic noise elements layered in there to give it more texture, you know? Yeah, I mean, with the Mersbo thing, the Mersbow or however you want to say it, I like that. I like that guy's stuff, but I like it when he's like collaborates with other people. Yes, yeah, yeah, I agree. When with it that. when it's an added thing, it's it's a hundred times more powerful. You know, it's like when when the the Mersbo uh, Full of Hell collaboration came out. That album fucking rips. Yeah. It does actually, you know, and it, it melds stuff well the, together. He also did stuff with Melvin's. I think that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's he's done stuff with Melvin's. He they've done a couple of records. Um, him and Thurston Moore and uh, B- uh, Balaz Pondy. You may know him from being in Europe. He's uh, of course, yeah. I mean, he used to do uh, all the shows in Budapest. Actually, he was a promoter out there. Yeah. That's yeah. how I met him. We played in a in a bomb in an old bomb shelter, and he was there um, in the in the very front. Like he never left the front of the stage, wearing an old school fucking Benham shirt. And I'm just like, I don't know who the fuck this guy is, but I'm gonna I'm um, I'm gonna take that Benham shirt home with me. And then we ended <laughs> up like like staying with him and stuff. And the only day we had on that entire month long tour that we had any time to actually see a city was in Budapest and he took us all over. He's the nicest, funniest fucking dude. I still talk to him on Facebook all the time. He's an incredible musician, you know, like jazz and improv stuff and the the stuff that's him and Mersbow and Thurston Moore is like really cool and interesting if you ever get a chance to listen to some of that stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff I like actually. And I saw Balaj play with uh, Mersbow or Mersbow, whatever. I, I still don't know how to fucking pronounce the guy's name, but anyway, <laughs> neither do I. Yeah, I just I'll, I just make my own shit up as I go along. And and uh, but they yeah. played at um they played at Vitus like a number of years ago, and it was cool. It was great. It was that's that's what I like when there's some kind of context to it, and it's not just like static or the sounds of like scraping metal or something like that, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you were saying a second ago, too, you know, you mentioned today is the day, you know, we we take a lot of influence from from that from them, too. I mean, we've all known Steve for 100 years. Love that dude. But some of the stuff that he did, I mean, even back in the 90s, people still can't match it today. I mean, the amount, you know, he's always been in a power. It's always been a power trio. You know, but the amount of stuff that's going on. You know, there's noise, there's crazy riffs, there's crazy, you know, incredible drumming, big, you know, bass lines, and then insane lyrics and vocal. And that's, you know, yeah. that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to do, too. But just, you know, with with heavier, fatter riffs, you know. Yeah, man, I remember the first time I heard today is a day uh, I I thought it was like the 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 hit the future of music man that was like the future of heavy music was today is a day and i think in some ways it was you know there's like so many bands wouldn't even exist without that guy you know you know as far as like what they do creatively you know yeah i mean i didn't even i heard it today's day on temple of the morning star i never heard the like the self-titled or supernova or any of those until years later. Oh, really? Okay. But yeah, you know, and, um, but temple, the morning star, like in the eyes of God, like those fucking records, man, that's some next level shit right there. Yeah, There's, definitely. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, I, I was a big, uh, fan of, uh, amphetamine reptile records, you know, like I was just way into that whole, uh, catalog 
and uh you know will power came out in the self-titled record and uh you know and uh that that was the stuff that it sounded it didn't sound like anything i'd ever heard and uh you know it was the musicianship was great it was just had this evil chaotic vibe to it and even on that record label which had a lot of very unique bands on there like hammerhead and you know the cows you know like totally way out bands like far out guys are on that label steve was even further out than a lot of that stuff and i was and it had like a kind of like a metal kind of thing going on which always really resonated with me you know what i mean and it's like i think that down the line i need to do a classic record today is a day i gotta pick one of those out and uh i mean there's it's hard it's hard to come up with a classic record they got such a volume of material out yeah i mean with that, I mean, it just depends on who you talk to, you know, which one of the any of the early today is the day ones. Because to me, it's, you know, it's Temple of the Morning Star and in the eyes of God. But if you talk to Mark, my guitar player, he's like, you know, self-titled Will Power, you know, Supernova. He he likes the those early AMREP ones where I like, of course, I like the ones that are more metal and more technical and. Yes, you know, it's hard to tell. It's hard to really pick one, man. You know, but but I mean, you you pull any one of those records out of any at any time, and that they're, they're the hammer every time. You know, it's just like you you get done listening to it, and it's only like thirty six minutes long, and you're like, motherfucker, that's the shit right there. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> you know, even his last couple records were good. Like the new record's really good. I've been spending some time with that too. Yeah, I mean. Steve's had some health problems and some, you know, he's been that, you know, it just seems like he, he always is like kind of rising from the ashes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And every time that it's like that, it, you, it comes out in his music. I mean, even, even when times were kind of really weird and they kind of had some records that maybe not weren't as good as what you would want them to be. If you go back and listen to him, you're just like, man, this is a dude that's really having some issues in his personal life and it's coming through in his music. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Definitely. You know, I mean, you know, I, it's I, like, I pretty much have all the albums and I listen to them more, some more than others, but I can see what you're saying. Definitely. Yeah. The, to, 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 the one thing about today's today is it's, it's very visceral. It's very visceral music. And you, and you know that, that when, when, like this, these last couple of records too, and the new one, the new one's really, really good. But you know, it's like I'm, you know, I don't know, I don't even know how to how to even verbalize it. You know, it's like he's struggling through on the on a personal level, and it just makes for for powerful, you know, for powerful music. Yeah, totally. So with Black Ops, how many actual releases do you guys have out? Like, I know there's a couple of things that are floating around. So what what is uh, what's your your guys' catalog to date like? We have um, a couple of splits out. The first thing we ever did, we did a split with a band from Houston called Crusher, which had three songs on it. There was a cassette release, and then it's on Bandcamp also. Then we did a split with uh, Cave Bastard from California. Yeah, I know those guys. And um, which is Troy Orfandal that used to be in uh, Cattle Decapitation. He's a he's like the two hundred and fifty pound look alike version of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if they if they made an an ugly metal movie remake of of the movie Twins, he would be Schwarzenegger and I would be Devito. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And then also uh, Nick Padrone is in that band, who is an old friend of mine from Dallas from like a hundred fucking years ago. He moved to California, and those dudes got hooked up. Um, and then we we recorded a full album that was actually mixed and mastered by Steve Austin from Today Is the Day. Um, but we separated. We got a different drummer. We had some issues. Our other drummer moved and. We basically have a full record that's produced and mixed and mastered by Steve Austin that we've never released. And then we just put out a live record that's just on Bandcamp. We basically bootlegged ourselves. And uh, 
we just put that on at Bandcamp like a month or so ago. That actually, the idea for that actually came from listening to your Metal Matters podcast. Really? Okay. Because you and um, who's the guy that does most of the point of entry records with you? Oh, uh, well, Randy, Randy Larson from Cable. He does uh, a lot of the, like the, uh, you know, the, the classic records ones. And the point of entry is like, I got a bunch of different people come in on that and uh, and they talk about what they how they got into certain stuff and what are important records for them. So there's been a couple of different guys who've done the point of entry stuff. Well, the one you guys did master uh, master of reality, Black Sabbath. Oh, that was Randy then. Yeah, that was a classic records one. Yeah, yeah. So who I don't, whoever that dude is, I want to hang out with with you two guys and just like talk because it just every, you I end up talking to myself when I listen to those podcasts. <laughs> Because it's just, it sounds just like people sitting down, you know, like yeah. talking about their favorite records. Because I mean, literally, that's what it is. But I was at, I was at work listening to that podcast, and you guys were talking about Sabbath, and then he had mentioned, like, man, I used to have like a shitty Black Sabbath live bootleg that had shitty sound quality and crappy artwork, and um, and I had the same thing because that you could literally find that tape anywhere for like three or four bucks it was super cheap and that same company they did a greatest hits black sabbath and that live black sabbath so i got the idea because we had a show coming up or no i think we had already played we had already played and uh my my friend nate that films a lot of our shows and does a lot of our like videos and shit like that he came to the show and and filmed it and taped the and taped it you know and I was like, you know, we could just bootleg ourselves and then bootleg that shitty artwork <laughs> that these guys, <laughs> that, that, that these two knuckleheads were just talking about on this fucking podcast. And uh, I ran it by the band and they're like, that's fucking hilarious. I'm like, no one will even get the joke unless they're at least 40 years old. Yeah, totally right. <laughs> because because anyone that's 40 has knows that cheap ass that tape or that CD because it was on CD too. And I actually I actually have it on vinyl too. That's how I have I it too. Is I have the LP of that. I got like 4.99 probably or something like that when I was a kid. Yeah, and it's like the worst that you know, it's like a a, a picture from a picture of the surface of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally random. It, yeah, it's like the worst shit. So we did that and then we uh we we made our logo and everything just like that cheap digital font that was that was on that record. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know, we could just call it, you know, Black Ops Live at Last, you know, and just completely rip that all the way off. And then Mark chimed in with it. He was like, it should be live at least. He's like, because all of this shitty bootleg stuff. He's like, <laughs> at least it's at least we put out a live record, you know, and we all laughed at that. So that's how that came out. And actually the the audio on that actually sounds really good. You can tell that Nate, the guy with the camera was directly in line with my noise rig. Cause the, the noise is like in the upper, the upper part of the, of the, of the mix. But uh, it sounds, it sounds really good. The funny thing is that like today with like the consumer version electronics that everyone's using probably had, a higher level of technical uh, proficiency or technical fidelity than what Black Sabbath actually used to record that live album. Like just your fucking <laughs> phone, is probably a better quality recording than what's on that actual record. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> that is like the worst sound quality, but I think there's a, like a 14 minute version of Lord of this world that's on there. That's, that's kind of cool. But other than that, that, that album is complete and utter trash. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny because I remember, you know, when, when you're a kid, you know, you go out to the record store, you got like money from, you know, mowing lawns or whatever the hell. And like you're buying shit. It's like the Best Buy series is like, you know, like four ninety nine or whatever it is. And like I remember picking this up because it was like probably one of the only Sabbath records that they had at the, at the record store. And uh, as life went on, I was like, yeah, I listened to it. I'd be like. Is this even like a legitimate fucking release? Because it sounds so bad. And like, how the hell did like the band and their management ever think that was a good idea to put that record out? You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the same thing with like Black Flag Live 1984. Yeah. You know, they, they released that. And, you know, when I was younger, it's like, man, this sounds like dog balls. But I've went back again from listening to your 
you know, podcasts, listening to In My Head, and I got like on a like a three day bender of nothing but like listening to Black Flag all day every day. Yeah, and I listened to Who's Got the Ten and a Half probably five times. That's actually my the first time I ever heard Black Flag was that was that cassette, Who's Got the Ten and a Half, and then um, which was a life changer for me. But then I listened to that Live 1984. And uh, the sound quality is a lot less, but yeah. there's a lot like the, if you listen to that, if you really pay attention to that live set, the first half and the last half, you can tell that like it shows in the beginning, it's just Rollins just trying to get the show going. And then by the end, he's like a fucking ferocious animal like the the tone of his voice and he's just like kind of free forming some shit in there too. Oh yeah. Like you can, you can really kind of see it, kind of see him like, like coming into what he became at the end by, by the end of that live 84 record, you're just like, yeah, this is a next level motherfucker figuring out who he is right here. But since you mentioned uh, in my head, that's, that's always uh, a mixed bag with people. You know what I mean? Like what, what are your feelings on that record? Do you like that record at all? I love all of the all of the albums with Rollins. I love. Okay, good. Yeah, me too. You know, I mean, I love the early singers too. You know, yeah. Keith and Chavo and all that. But to me, that that band really, it was all to me. It's it was about Rollins, and there's plenty of people that'll fucking that that still argue with me about that. But they were <clears throat> once it got to. I mean, they had been a band for a while when Rollins came along. Yeah. I mean, Rollins was was a fucking was a kid, but they were. That was at the point when Greg Ginn was really trying to push the musical side of it in a different direction. It wasn't just fast punk rock anymore, you know. And that's that's why I like it because it's it's way more interesting to me. I mean, musically, it's it's like on a whole different level. Yeah, that, that's kind of the argument I have with a lot of people because I feel like. You know, Joel uh, Stallings, my former drummer from years ago in Anodyne, he uh, is one of the school of thought that Rollins, the Rollins era of the band is is not the the best version of the band. And, uh, you know, we would have, we would have ta- talks about that every, which I found weird because the dude is like way, like an excellent, very talented, incredibly ta- talented musician. Not just a drummer, like Joel is an incredible musician, period. And the fact that he enjoyed the early version of the band, like the more punk rock version of the band, I always found baffling to me. And um, yeah, that, that seems kind of crazy because I, I mean, I know Joel. And, yeah. And you would think that he would like the, the smarter version of the band than just the, hey, let's play fast and have funny, crazy songs, you know? I always found that odd, you know, and, and it's, yeah, yeah. I love Rollins. Of course. I think he's a great vocalist and incredible live presence. But the other thing was like, you, like you mentioned, Ginn was pushing in this way more progressive direction than anything they did prior to that. And that's combined with Rollins's intensity. Those two things, I think really set that band on a whole different trajectory than they would have been on if they'd stay just playing like three chord, like punk songs, you know? So I, I don't get that, that argument that some people have, you know? I mean, most of the people that I know that, you know, really like the, the faster, straightforward punk rock stuff are just, they're just punk rock people. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, that's, that's what they, that's what they still play to this day, you know? And there's, there's plenty of people out there that, that just don't like Rollins, you know, which, I mean, I don't give a shit about that. I'm a huge Rollins fan. He was a, a huge influence on me personally and musically but you know when, when it was greg Ginn, he was he was a big jazz guy you know and he wanted he was influenced by ornette coleman and he said before that the latter the latter version of black flag that he wanted to be the john coltrane of guitar yeah Man, yeah definitely it shows definitely you can tell that I mean, when I first heard those records when I was a kid, I was just like, oh, this is just a punk rock guy. Because I came from a metal background, you know, listening to Maiden and Slayer. And and also I liked a lot of progressive rock and, you know, shit like that, you know, and listening to Malmsteen. And like, I was really into like lots of notes and all that stuff. And when I heard Black Flag, I was like, oh, shit, you know, 
these this is just raw as fuck i you know i didn't know what punk rock was in 1985 you know yeah totally you know, in being in Oklahoma or the Texas Panhandle, like I didn't know what the fuck punk rock was, and I, I was like, "Hold on a second, this band is all fucking power and no brains." And it's just because it seemed to me then, like you know, this guy's like trying to play a solo or play a lead, and he doesn't really know what he's doing, but he's fumbling through it. And then, like you know, twenty years later, I'm like, when I first start listening to jazz, I'm like, "Oh shit, this guy is." really knows he really knows what the fuck he's doing but he's he's trying to play jazz in a punk rock setting and and make it and make it aggressive you know it it took it took decades for my fucking chimpanzee brain to pick up on that (laughs) yeah it's like that weird disharmony between those two things like that were opposing each other i think that really makes the fucking band like amazing and just completely fucking groundbreaking yeah, I mean those those late Black Flag records make so much more sense as a grown up than they ever did when I was a kid, because there's so much musically going on, and you don't even really get it. So, I mean, some of the lyrics are, you know, lyrically it's not all that, all that, you know, like drinking and driving. There's some, you know, there's still some some fun, upbeat, fast songs, but like swinging man you know there's some there's some fucking deep shit in there when especially when Rollins started actually writing yeah. you know people don't really realize that a lot of those records he was on Ginn was writing those lyrics and going here you go henry you know work with this yeah that's true you know and, and uh and i think that's still why i prefer the later material too that's like when he would start to come into his own and you can see his personality being injected into the lyrics you know but uh, yeah, the the <clears throat> the drummer too that's on those live eighty four records, Anthony, whatever is I don't remember what his last name is. Like that drummer was a one of the best drummers that they ever had. Yeah, he wasn't on any of the records besides the live ones. He didn't record with them ever. I don't think. Yeah, you know, just maybe maybe some demos or something like that. Yeah, Black Flag was kind of like Spinal Tap in that way. It was like how you know <laughs> how many different drummers are they gonna fucking have? Oh, dude, Di- yeah. <laughs> different drummers on the record, different live drummers, di- different drummer on a different tour. I mean, the shit like never stopped. So with Black Ops, like once all this shit, we come out to the other side of this uh, global pandemic. Uh, what what do you guys got? You know, what are your plans? You know, more recordings. What's the deal? Yeah, we're we were supposed to be in the studio next next weekend to record everything, record a new full length, and you know we'll just have to once this once this Roni is done, then you know we'll get back and practice up, and then go and record a full length and try to figure out if, you know if we can afford to go on tour and start playing shows, and we we definitely want to get out. You know we we haven't played really outside of Texas. Unfortunately, it's it's been kind of a difficult thing. We were supposed to be play New Orleans, and that you know we had I got, <laughs> I, I, I got bit by a dog and it got infected. Oh shit! I, they almost had to do surgery on my thumb, and Damn. it was a big convoluted pile of nonsense. So we really want to get out and you know maybe do you know string along like seven or ten shows and you know really kind of get out and uh, play and once this new full length, once we record it and get it out, we definitely want to see what we can do with it for sure. Right on. Is there a central location? I know that there's, you know, like band camp, but you got these videos and all that sort of stuff. So if people wanted to, uh, you know, check out some of this stuff, like, you know, what, what are the various places that people can f- watch the videos, purchase the music, download the music, or just listen to streams or that, any of that kind of stuff? Well, all all the music and all that stuff just to listen to is on Bandcamp. If anybody wants to purchase it, that's all on Bandcamp. Uh, Black Ops is B L K O P S, and then um, our we're on Instagram, the same thing, and then um, also on Face. Facebook has a lot of the videos, and then you know some of us doing you know some jam room stuff and some live videos are on there. That's probably the the easiest way to get to it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, every time we play with with bigger bands that come through, they're just like, "Holy shit, we can't believe you guys aren't signed, or you know, you're not you're not out doing more." And 
we're like, yeah, <laughs> we're we're surprised too. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, it's, uh, it's fucking hilarious sometimes. It's like you, you put so much into something and sometimes it goes over people's heads and, you know, it yeah. is what it is. So we're just, we're, we, we're going to have as much fun with it as we can. And, you know, hopefully we can make something happen with it. Yeah, man. So, you know, well, good luck with everything, man. And hopefully you guys stay, uh, you know, everyone stays safe and healthy and, uh, when this is all over with, uh, you guys will be out there with some new material that people can check out. Yeah, those guys, um, they've both been at home now for like two or three weeks. They they don't have essential jobs, you know, so they're they're not out in the public. My job's considered essential, so I'm still out, you know, working five days a week. But other than that, those dudes are, you know, pretty safe. Seems like, and this, you know, whenever this shit's over, we'll definitely start laying the fucking hammer down again so I'm, I'm hoping that you're keeping the uh proper social distancing while you're out there working morgan because i worry about you man yeah you know i got gloves on all the time and in a lot of the places that we're working are pretty much empty anyway good you know so that's good I, i've never washed my hands so much in my life as i'm washing them right now <laughs> yeah man but yeah totally. you, you know it's like i they issue us, you know, masks when we have them at work and, you know, there's a, a whole protocol, you know, cause I'm not, I don't want to get that shit and I definitely don't want to, you know, bring it home to my wife, you know, it's the last thing I would want to do. Yeah, totally, man. It's, it's, uh, definitely a scary scenario that's out there and, uh, but sure, you know, New York, man, it's like you guys are getting fucking hammered up there. Yeah, I mean, the one thing about it, too, is like, I think that this is going to just go, we're going to hit a peak, and then the rest of the country is going to peak. Different states or whatnot are going to see the same kind of thing. You know, it's going to just sweep across the rest of the country, you know. And the fact that, like, you know, we have international airports and there's, like, a travel, there's, like, a travel hub. I think that's why. And everyone's living on top of each other and just the general selfish nature of New Yorkers who just don't give a fuck about people. Uh, I think that's why we're in such uh, a dire circumstance here. And I think that hopefully the rest of the country observes what's going on here and is able to, uh, you know, apply uh, more common sense than we did in, in, in uh, New York. And hopefully things don't get to be as bad in other places as it is here. Yeah. I was talking with uh, Alan Dubbin from con eight and Nah earlier today and checking up on him and, He's, you know, he's been working from home for a while, so. Yeah, it's it's tough, but, you know, it's, it's keep it's a mental game, you know, more than anything. Just keeping your shit together and, you know, making sure you, you kind of follow some kind of routine, you know. I mean, like for, like for me, I have, my job is cool. I can work at home. It's good. But uh, making sure I get up at the same time every day, making sure I eat my lunch at the same time, making sure I train, making sure I, you know, don't get too far down a mental rabbit hole is really the best thing to do uh, and also stay aware but also don't get wrapped up in what the press is putting out there i think sometimes there's a lot of uh, irresponsibility that the press uses to as headlines and to try to follow that up with actual science and read what scientists have to say about this whole thing and pay attention more to the health industry than what the headlines say you know i think that's an important thing to do yeah i mean I, I can only handle so much of it watching it on TV or yeah. listening to, you know, I listen to NPR and a lot just to try to get information, but it just gets fucking depressing after a while. So yeah, it really does, man. It's like right now you and I should be standing next to each other in Philly at the decibel. That's beer, right. Beer, beer festival. And we're, you know, we're not. <laughs> it was this. It's supposed. It was supposed to be this weekend, man. And I was like really looking forward to it. And it's fucking. I'm sitting in an apartment talking to you on Skype. Yeah, it's fucking. <laughs> I mean, I was like looking at my tickets. I, I, they say they're once once this is over with, they're gonna they're gonna do it. So yeah. they're gonna honor the tickets. I was like looking at my tickets, and I was just like, fuck, fuck. I'm supposed to be in Philly right now with with Mike, and you know, I was gonna hang out with fucking Eli. You know, yeah, like, man. 
Eli from Relapse and Herb Jala. I, I love Herb. I've known that dude for fucking ever. We were all like making plans, like, you know, like, oh, we're going to fucking hang out and talk so much shit, you know? And now it's just like, oh, well, I washed my hands 47 times today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, uh, Morgan. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me about all this stuff. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll see you soon, man. Yeah, once this shit's over with, I'm sure there's going to be a lot. Of people are going to want to get out and have fun again. And, you know, I'll, we'll definitely see each other, dude. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Metal Matters, a Gimme Radio weekly podcast. Tune in next week and see what we have in store for you. The show is available on all streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, etc. Also, be sure to check out Gimme Radio, streaming on the web, iOS, or Android. For one of the best metal communities, exclusive merch, interviews with artists, and so much more. I'll catch you guys next week. Take care.